Hello everyone, thank you for joining our webinar, Analytical Considerations for Quantification of Polyphenols in Virgin Olive Oil. This webinar will be hosted by John Ruther, President of Eurofin Central Analytical Laboratories, and Mary Mori, Director of Technical Services at California Olive Ranch. I'm Genevieve Randall, and I'll be moderating this webinar. Before we begin, I'll let you know more about how this webinar will run. The webinar is being recorded and the slides and recording will be available for you within three business days. A short Q&A session will follow the presentation where our speakers will answer any viewer submitted questions. During the webinar, you can submit questions you have using the webinar sidebar menu. Select the questions tab, type in your question, then hit the enter key on your keyboard. Remember, you can submit questions throughout the webinar, and any questions we don't get to, our speakers will follow up after. Okay, a little bit about Eurofins. Eurofins is driven by our mission to contribute to global health by offering the highest quality testing, training, auditing, and consulting services. We strive to listen to our customers and not simply meet but exceed our expectations. Our footprint is global with 45,000 staff in over 800 laboratories across 47 countries and a portfolio of over 200,000 analytical methods. Eurofins provides a unique range of analytical testing services to the pharmaceutical, food, environmental, and consumer products industries and to governments. All right, Mary, uh, you can get started. Perfect, thank you, Genevieve. Um, so a little bit uh, about our company, California Olive Ranch. Um, I work for, I'm the Director of Technical Services at California Olive Ranch and have been closely working with John over the past few years as we've used Eurofins as our primary lab for testing. Um, California Olive Ranch, we're one of the leaders in the industry in California, in the United States, producing high extra um, quality, extra virgin olive oils and recently um, have ventured into um, purchasing oils as well and we produce and have our mill in Northern California. Uh, we've been expanding our testing capabilities in-house uh, to be able to test our oils and meeting the needs of our customers and our processing facility as well. So really kind of working with John on some of these parameters and kind of the topic we have today stemmed from a uh, meeting we had years ago of kind of what drivers, what programs that we need um, in testing and one topic being phenols where there's in our industry, not a lot of work that has gone around that. So Eurofins kind of spent a lot of time working on that and um, kind of giving you guys a summary of where, where that came from. Um, topics that I'm gonna cover are kind of just kind of educating on how, how do we use phenols in terms of us as a producer and seller of olive oil really comes with the human and the oil health. So what is what is important about the phenols and the oil, how we use it to educate our consumers, what are the regulations around our industry? And then a new method that we've been um, evolving this year is being able to test it in-house and utilizing it on our near-infrared spectrometer um, with Eurofin's uh, QTA group. So getting into it, um the why are the phenols important to us as a producer grower uh phenols for the industry are important because of the shelf life for the oil so the, the phenols in the oil are actually beneficial to the oil itself it helps stable stabilize the oil make sure that you have longer shelf life it'll also, it's a tool used in pr some of the prediction models to dictate how oil, how long the oil will last and it helps us understand how good of an oil it could be. A higher phenol oil is going to last longer and be a stronger oil for the shelf life to stay as extra virgin. A lower um, phenol oil might not last as long. Um, it also has a strong correlation to taste. Higher phenol oil is gonna be more bitter, more pungent. A lower phenol is gonna be milder. And so we use that to understand what does our consumers want? And we try to work on how we can mill the oil to get a different taste profile with the phenol content. Um, in terms of on the consumer side, it matters to them. Is, um, the phenols is the number, is 
there's many healthy attributes about olive oil, but the phenols really is that parameter that makes olive oil stand out from other oils. It's the health attributes around the phenol content in providing health, health to your body, to your blood, is the key driver of why consumers are actually starting to care about it. All of these healthy foods out there, the um, the superfoods the, are really come down to the antioxidant attributes of them, and phenols are an antioxidant. So it's kind of one of those foods in that superfood category. Um, with consumers, it really kind of the, the health of side of the oil comes down to the anti-inflammatory, heart health, brain health, among other things that have been increasing in research around the attributes of phenols. Um, what phenols are important. This is what came down to a lot of when we were talking to John a lot on this is there's some methods out there on testing total phenols, but what we're finding in the olive oil category that there are many phenols in an olive oil and there's certain phenols that are actually more important than others in those specific health attributes to the human body. And those kind of, these are just the, some of the main phenols that are in oil. The two that really have the biggest driving factors of health and that we hear the most about is oleocanthal, oleuropin. Um, and that's kind of the focus on some of the health details I'm gonna talk about today is really geared around those two um, fields. Um, in terms of the phenol content, that's where we can get different rates of phenol content on those different types of oils. And without knowing, without being able to test what type of phenol oil phenol is in your oil, you won't know how to dictate if that oil could be healthier for your heart or healthier for your brain. So we, we want to understand what phenols are actually in the oil to be able to dictate what might potentially be beneficial of this oil, how can we help sell that to the consumer and how can we help guide them of what oil to purchase for what they want it for. Um, the phenol content is very driven by variety, even down to the type of phenol, but ultimately the total phenols is very driven by variety. I have a list to the right showing the typical level. So a higher phenol oil is gonna be typically the, the more robust varieties and always conducive of if it's a higher phenol level, it's going to be very bitter, very pungent, but it is going to be that more perceived healthy oil, which is right as we call cor corniki, cornicabra, coratina, leciano, manzanillo, moreolo. Um, in the moderate category, you have more of those medium flavored oils, is the Kuala Bersana, Mission, Ascalano, Frantoyo. And then low, these are usually more of what we would classify as mild oils. Um, very buttery, usually kind of a more easy to use on anything, easy to use in baking type of oil, Arbequina, Barnea, Dagiasca is the kind of the lower category. Um, but that's not to say, so typically the variety is going to dictate if it does or doesn't have high phenols, but in the milling and growing practices, we can actually manipulate that with different practices that we can take. So deficit irrigation, we can, at the very end of um, growing right before harvest. We can reduce our water intake, so therefore it pumps up the amount of phenols that end up in the oil. We can reduce our phenol content by over irrigating, by giving the olive too much water, and then it milds out the phenol content. The phenols end up going out in the water. Or we can, in the mill, we can add water in our malaxer where we crush the fruit, and that'll end up reducing the phenol content. We can harvest early where the fruit is really green, uh, and we're gonna increase the phenol content or we can harvest later in season where we have very ripe fruit, more purple fruit, and you're gonna have more of a lower phenol content. So there's means in our processing that we can change these and based on what the consumer wants, we might do some of these to be able to change the type of oil that we're going to get. And why phenols are good for the oil? The, the rule of thumb kind of is that, you know, it is healthy for us, but ultimately the, why it's there and purpose is actually to be healthy for the oil, to healthy for the olive, it protects the olive from oxidation. 
And then that oxidation leads to rancidity. So the idea of the phenols in there is it's helping that olive survive. Well, in turn, by us consuming olive oil, it's helping us as well because it's being an oxidation, it's preventing oxidation in our blood and in our bodies. Uh, the higher phenolic content helps um, protect the shelf life in a way of, we, we describe it as it kind of acts as a jacket over the fat. And so the first thing to degrade is the phenols. So then your fats are protected. The more phenols you have, the longer it will take to degrade those phenols first. And then it gives that fat more time to be protected. So the fat is not degrading and oxidizing, which leads to the rancidity flavors. And a little guide down here of just kind of considering what um, the total phenol content um, in terms of the intensity of the oil, in terms of the bitterness, and then you can rule of thumb know that a higher phenol oil is typically going to have a longer shelf life than a lower phenol oil. And how do you balance that? How do you make sure you communicate that to the consumer and internally into your facility? Um, use this from some research that BioLab has done recently of kind of correlating this of 220 uh, parts per million phenol is a very low, if not non-bitter oil. It's also considered really a mild oil and a light bitter to a very bitter oil. Typically when you get into a bitter and very bitter oil, those are oils that the everyday consumer is not ready for yet. So we also have to uh, marry it up with that of, are the consumers ready for a high bitter oil? Yes, this oil will last longer, but the consumer might not be ready. That's why we, we're constantly wanting to monitor this because if the consumer doesn't like that, then we don't have anything to sell to the customer. Therefore, it's important for us as a facility, as a seller of oil to understand what the phenol content is of our oil. Now, olive oil is a functional food. Functional food is really that kind of, that new term coined for foods that are healthy for you. There's a, in the food, in, in the consumption industry, as a lot of people are seeing, there was a, a trend of taking pills and, and mitigating all your health by taking pills and doing all these other, other means of being healthy. But really what people are finding is it's actually more important to have a functional food where you're actually eating the healthiness of that food in the true food and that's how your body will actually uptake it more. Your body will actually digest things more when it's actually consumed how it was intended to be. And a lot of research out there doesn't really show if consuming a pill of say fish oil really does the same thing in your body as just eating fish. Um, and a lot of research has been done around this on olive oil as it relates to the Mediterranean diet and finding the, the link of olive oil is really one of the main components and why there, there's a lot of research going on now of switching it and focusing strictly on olive oil and what is it doing to the diet and how can it be beneficial to, to our diet. Um, for humans, a lot of what olive oil does is the anti-inflammatory acts like ibuprofen in the body. So it's a natural um, anti-inflammatory that you can consume if you have high inflammation. You would take ibuprofen. You can also eat some olive oil, high phenol olive oil. Um, it's very heart healthy. It absorbs the free radicals in our blood to keep our heart and cardiovascular systems healthy, thus reducing oxidation of our blood that can be uh, negative for our health has a lot of brain health with a lot of this new potential um, research coming out of potentially helping with Alzheimer's, cancer, Parkinson's, uh, breast cancer. There's a lot of new research showing that the phenol content of olive oil is one of the key drivers to help mitigate some of these um, diseases that are coming out and really trying to find solutions to prevent them and for so many, vast amount of people that are starting to get these new diseases. The, the one trick to this, it always comes down to, do we know how much phenol is considered a good quantity to consume on a daily basis? We don't. It's depending on who you ask, and there's not a lot of research out there around this, that that's kind of the next step on the human food side is really understanding what parts per million amount is important to be able to consume. Um, there's also a lot of discussion and debate around 
the thought process of consuming a tablespoon of olive oil a day? Is that going to be just as effective as cooking with the olive oil or eating olive oil with other foods? <laughs> and that's really kind of a debate of person's beliefs and really it's something that needs to get re um, get evaluated so that way we can really understand is it just as good to eat oil versus better to eat oil with other foods because there's a lot of different nutrients usually your vitamins your minerals are oil soluble or water soluble and only if you eat them with those certain things do you actually uptake them so if you don't eat broccoli with uh, with an oil you're not going to get some of the vitamins out of the broccoli because there's not a lot of fat in that diet. So there's fat being consumed with other foods is actually going to be of more benefit than just by itself. Um, in terms of how we promote this, we know consumers are really interested in it lately. We at, at California Olive Ranch, we get a lot of questions about what is your phenol content? People are really understanding that the phenols is important and want to understand what oils are higher phenols and really educate on this. Um, so how do we promote that? Right now in the United States, there's no current ability to, no, to promote necessarily on labels in terms of saying this is a high phenol oil. All of that would be theoretical and it's not regulated by the government, by the FDA. Um, there is a potential that we could request it as an industry. And so it's something that we could eventually do if we're, able to define what the RDI, which is the um, recommended daily intake. If we can determine that of what is a good value of intake for humans to consume, then we can start promoting it on labels and make health claims around the phenol content of certain oils, where those higher phenolic oils, if people want to eat it because it's healthy for them, now they'll know that that bottle is healthy for them. Um, really wanting to work on education, educating consumers with the importance of phenols, that's the, definitely the industry is really swaying towards working a lot with um, different industry groups, educating people on why phenols are important, why you actually want to try and find foods that have high phenols and olive oil being one of those. So we're going to hopefully someday see some change in the USA. Um, in Europe, there is a regulation that you can label um, with the statement um, as long as there's five milligrams per 20 grams of oil, but it has to be specifically testing the hydroxytyrosol and their derivatives, which is oil and, and tyrosol. The, the, it's very specific, so that's where testing your phenol content is so important because you actually have to specifically to test for these phenols. The statement that they require you to say um, is in the orange box right there, and that would be something that you have to put the full sentence on your label. The downfall to some of those claims is that's a lot of text to put on your label, so that's where a lot of people haven't yet started to use, but hoping to see the change where we can start educating people on the, the health benefits of olive oil more than just the label. Um, another side to this project we've been working on, um, we have Eurofin's um, Quality Trait Analysis Group, We've been working heavily on getting olive oil and olive testing on NIR and getting repeatable, accurate results on the NIR, um, NIR being near-infrared spectrometers. Uh, the purpose of that really comes down to is the, the NIR at our facility, at a, at a facility where we're producing and manufacturing oil, is a lot easier to do, get results within a minute. It, goes quicker, we get good results that we can use and meaningful, that we don't have to have all of the needs to do all the wet chemistry, have the chemicals and or the complex equipment that some of these tests take. Um, so that's been a really big project we've been working on with them to really get um, robust um, databases out there and uh, phenols is being one of them. So we've been working on that one this year. The chart to the right is showing you what parameters we currently have in there. The range, um, as I said on a few slides previously, there's the parts per million range for total phenols and getting down to what's the lowest range, the highest range, and then showing the accuracy. And we're, we're still working on it. This 81 per, um, R2, we want to see closer into the higher 90s. So as we get more samples into the database, it'll be improved, but we see the progress there. Um, 
on phenols, but you can see the other parameters that are working really well in NIR, and we, we feel very confident that total phenols will get in there eventually. Um, but what that can tell us is now that can give us a baseline in testing on our product, so we can know if what we're going to be labeling as high phenol oil will be accurate. We can also know and test more regularly throughout time. Every month we check our tanks, so we can test it in-house on the phenol content with minimal cost. So we're really trying to focus on um, testing all of as, as much as we can, as quickly as we can to get meaningful data. Um, here's an example of kind of what the NIR database models look like. You'll see um, the, the blue dots and the purple dots. Those are new data points. The green are things that came from last year. So we send our data to uh, QTA where they evaluate the correlation between our official method, which we did with um, Eurofin's lab, the chemical lab, which on Ruthers, and then we do the NAR, and then they're building this algorithm to be able to have all of these dots as much as possible on a single line, which means if, if the official method, me method said, say on this water content 0.2, well then the NAR will also say 0.2, and that's what we focus on trying to get that database built up and built very accurately. Um, water content is having a really good trend line. Our peroxide value is having a pretty good trend line. And then the, you can see here is the phenols. We have some work to do. There's a lot kind of going up and down, but that's where we are able to see, okay, we don't have a lot of samples out here. Let's work here and let's work on the lower end. Why we can't, we need to get kind of a cleaner line. And this, these charts are really helpful for us to visualize where do we need to work on with these databases with um, QTA. And that kind of sums up um, what our testing and the, the why, and I'll um, hand it off to John to help kind of explain the, the official method testing that they do. Thanks, Thanks Mary. Mary. Uh, my name is John Ruther. I'm uh, president of uh, Eurofin's Central Analytical Laboratories in New Orleans. And uh, as Mary said, we've been working with California Olive Ranch for many years uh, to support uh, their analytical needs. Uh, we started uh, doing um, reference testing for uh, the California uh, standard uh, for olive oil testing by, uh, by handlers. And uh, we've been working uh, for years with that and have uh, gotten to a point where we're starting to expand some services for special needs like uh, polyphenols testing is, uh, and, and working uh, closely with Mary on those projects. <clears throat> so what's driving uh, the need for, for quantitative polyphenol methods? Uh, I think, uh, as, uh, as Mary mentioned, there's a lot of health interest in polyphenols and olive oil. Uh, in the uh, health research areas, uh, there are many, many uh, workers uh, doing studies, clinical studies with olive oil and olive oil uh, extracts uh, to, to demonstrate the uh, health capabilities of many of the polyphenol compounds. And uh, specifically, uh, oleocanthal and uh, oleo, oleorupane uh, complexes are, um, are of interest in this area. Uh, the, United, the European Union has has gone so far as to allow health claims um, or label claims uh, on on olive oil uh, that uh, demonstrates uh, contents of uh, five milligrams of hydrotyrosol and its derivatives per 20 grams of oil, and uh, that's a relatively mild uh, requirement uh, actually in the world of olive oil, but it requires an analytical method that that truly uh, can uh, determine those accurately and reproducibly between uh, between different varieties of oil. So um, as we understand at this moment, there are a couple of methods that have been submitted uh, for use here, uh, but uh, to date, I don't believe there's anybody that uh, has been approved or anybody's method that's been currently approved for this. But I believe the method that has been submitted uh, seems to be sound, and it incorporates uh, chromatography methods uh, that target the specific compounds and their derivatives, and it also incorporates an acid hydrolysis step to convert some of the derivatives into measurable compounds that uh, standards don't exist for. So uh, we think it's on the right path, and uh, it, once this method becomes uh, official, uh, which we think will probably not be too much longer, um, 
then uh, we will, of course, adopt that uh, for use in our laboratory for these types of measurements and start generating data. Um, and then um, the uh, olive research uh, efforts have been um, have have been really driven by uh, an organization called the, um, the Yale Olive Institute, which which is a recent uh, startup. Um, it started in in 2018 uh, and and draw and drew from members of the olive oil industry, uh, from some of the marketing uh, producers, uh, health researchers, and uh, and uh, many of the trade group organizers, uh, trade group leads. Uh, and and I was uh, fortunate enough to attend that uh, inaugural meeting in uh, Connecticut last year, and I was very impressed with the quality of the organization. Uh, so there is a need being driven by these uh, health uh, researchers to uh, to have analytical methods that are reliable and target the specific compounds that have health interests. So a little bit more about this uh, Yale Olive Institute. Uh, it's it's driven by consumer needs, and it's multifaceted. So uh, there there are elements and different work groups within the institute that focus on their specific responsibilities. Uh, Eurofins is involved uh, in the chemistry part of the, uh, of the effort, and uh, we interact with a lot of the health, health researchers directly uh, to meet their needs and to support some of their projects. And uh, so we find it to be a very uh, gratifying exercise in working with uh, with the trade group people, uh, with uh, with and with consumers directly, uh, to try to facilitate this uh, work that's very important work in in health research for olive oil. Uh, currently, just to give an overview of um, of the more common methods used for characterizing and, and quantifying uh, uh, polyphenols in in uh, world olive oil labs. The, the only uh, really official method uh, that's been recognized by um, the, um, the Olive Institute or the, uh, the International Olive Council, I'm sorry, let me get back to where I was here, is the uh, chromatography method that's uh, been published by the uh, International Olive Council under DOC 29. Uh, this is a method that's um, that's used in, in most of the reference laboratories around the world. And um, they, uh, the, the, the problem is with this method is it is a, it's a relatively non-targeted method. So it's a bit empirical in the fact that only one compound is actually used to calibrate the method. And then all the uh, response factors are basically corrected against that, uh, against that one standard. So, uh, when you have multiple different response factors for the different polyphenols of interest, uh, there's no real differentiation of that in the method. And so it's just the sum of all of those individual polyphenol groups that are calculated as the total polyphenol content. And as you'll see in a later slide, the, the response factors for some of the more important polyphenols are very, very suppressed in this method at the wavelengths that being measured, so that's a concern. Uh, another method that's very popular, it's a very, much, uh, very quick and uh, very inexpensive method, but very, very popular and gives very good information is the uh, Follin Cachalto method. Uh, it's, uh, it's easily run in the laboratory. Uh, the polyphenols are extracted from the oil and then measured colorimetrically with this reagent, uh, the Follin Cachalto reagent. It's been in use for many, many years to measure phenols. Uh, it's also non-targeted, so uh, all of the phenols react with the reagent, produce a color. And uh, unfortunately, it also reacts with some other non-phenolic compounds, uh, but those are also of interest in olive oil health. So the method is considered a good overall method uh, for assessing uh, antioxidant capability and phenolic activity. And so uh, many of the published data that you see um, in the trade around polyphenols actually uses this method, and uh, it seems to be reproducible between laboratories. And I think that's the more important point: is that uh, it's uh, it's reproducible, it produces consistent data, and the, the data is targeted towards certain health benefits. Now, what we haven't studied yet is the response factors of again some of the more important 
uh, polyphenols uh, with that method and to see if they are represented properly by the method, which I think is probably an important point for people that are starting to look at these in more detail. <clears throat> Another method coming uh, from some workers is uh, is NMR, um, and it uh, it has the capability of being targeted and and selective for the individual compounds. And again, like most um, instrumental methods, they require pure standards for calibration, which are in limited supply these days. But uh, it seems to be getting a little bit better. Uh, the nice thing about NMR is it is a non-destructive method. So uh, in the course of testing for polyphenols, there's an opportunity sometimes for conversion of the polyphenols into their metabolites or to some other compounds using the, you know, because they're chemical methods. But uh, NMR does not have that problem. So uh, unfortunately, NMR is a relatively expensive technique and is reserved for just a few labs around the world. But it's a good method to be able to compare your um, maybe your chromatography data or your colorimetric data against when you're trying to uh, validate your methods. And then finally, the method that we've been uh, working with here in uh, New Orleans is an LCMSMS method, and uh, it is uh, it is considered a, a relatively sensitive method uh, by lab standards. Uh, it has um, a decent repeatability within the laboratory. And uh, hasn't been actually promulgated in too many laboratories around the world, so we don't have reproducibility data. But the method itself is modeled after the extraction of the official IOC method that we've uh, that we've been using for years, and simply replaces the HPLC method with a with an LCMSMS method, which uses actual standards uh, standard compounds to to calibrate and to target the specific compounds that we're interested in. Uh, so a little bit more about these methods. Uh, the, the methods, the methodologies that we just described are, are really sufficiently different to produce different results uh, when, when looking at polyphenol data. So it's important to know what method that you're, you're really looking at when you look at polyphenol data that's on labels or in marketing uh, information and so forth. Uh, I think uh, in many cases, um, uh, the units themselves are telling. Uh, the units that these results are reported in will tell you pretty much what, what method is being run. So if you're, if you're reporting gallic acid equivalents or caffeic acid equivalents, it's generally going to probably be a color metric method. Or if you see tyrosol equivalents, it's probably going to be a uh, chromatography, chromatography method. And those methods will probably generate some different results. I think in general, the, the uh, the chromatography methods are going to be uh, expected to be a little bit lower because they don't include the um, uh, the other antioxidant compounds that are present in, in olive oil that are not specifically phenols. <clears throat> the other point is that the IOC standard method itself uh, is shown to be not very reproducible between laboratories because of the chromatography difference in chromatography in uh, instruments to, uh, around the world. Uh, so the resolution of the chromatograph, the peak resolution, and the symmetry and so forth can have a very different effect on this method, depending on how it's deployed by the various labs. And we've seen that even when uh, exchanging results between two, two European labs, that the data can be different. So um, I know that um, I know that uh, you know we are trying to improve that with the targeted method. Because with the calibration standards being run every day, every time a batch is run, that re really should, uh, uh, you know, minimize the difference difference between laboratory results. So as we as we work on the method that we're employing here and make it more rugged, rugged and reliable, I believe you'll see more acceptance between using it in other laboratories, especially laboratories that are supporting health claims. And um, and so um, the compounds that we were looking at in the development of our method here that have been uh, more or less uh, appointed by the health researchers are um, are classified into different groups, uh, different types of phenolic groups, as you see in the slide, and uh, and the ones that we really want to be sure that we're we're uh, accounting for correctly is the oleoropene, a glycone. 
um, the oleocanthal and, and the ligastride is the, is the, in, uh, are some of the ones that are more important. Seems to be a delay. Um, Genevieve, can you go back to the next last slide for me? Yep. Yeah, perfect, right there. That's good. Okay. So this is an outline of the standard IOC method for um, uh, for um, polyphenols analysis. And um, and so as you see, it's uh, it's in a, it's a simple weight of two grams of oil, and adding one mil of the internal standard. Mix 30 seconds, five mil, five mils of 80 percent methanol. Mix one minute, sign a cage centrifuge, and then uh, filter and run by HPLC. And the um, the basis for the method, really the calculation, is all about this internal standard that's used. Um, so that is it's really the quantitative part of the method. There are no other calibration compounds used in this method. And this is a this is an example of the um, of the calculation here. So we use um, syringic acid as the internal standard, and uh, we use tyrosol as the single component for calibration. And the response factors of those uh, are uh, relative response factors are calculated, and then each in, and then the sum of the peaks um, throughout the the, the entire uh, spectrum of the chromatogram is calculated and then incorporated in the equation below for calculation of total polyphenols. So when you see the chromatogram that we're we're integrating from, you'll see that. Um, depending on what wavelength is being used, uh, this is actually a commercial mix of standard compounds. And the, the wavelength that's usually measured for this in the literature is uh, 220. But the, uh, we've also accumulated data here at, at 280 and 7, uh, 3, 373, which seem to be more um, um, actually the I'm sorry, the, the actual method is uses 373 as the wavelength of interest, but uh, other wavelengths that could be used are 220 and 280. And um, you can see that the um, sensitivity of the method at 220 is significantly better than it is at the wavelength that's normally employed. So um, as a result, there's very little uh, in the way of uh, oleocanthal peak size that can be can be um, measured in, in this uh, and oleoropine is the same way they're very insensitive compared to some of the other compounds uh, that we use for uh, polyphenol uh, analysis. So here's a typical chromatogram of an olive oil um, using the um, HPLC method. And you can see it's very, very rich. <clears throat> um, but when you look at it compared to the polyphenol calibration mix, you see a lot of peak shifting between the major components in olive oil and the actual peaks that are in the uh, standard. So that's a concern for us. Um, it's not a big concern in the method in the method itself because you're summing all of these peaks to assess the polyphenol content. But in trying to determine individual polyphenols, uh, the concentration of individual polyphenols could be quite challenging by using this method. And the other problem is, is how much are the real important polyphenols represented by this method? So again, here's um, the, the chromatogram. And uh, identification of the individuals are going to be very tricky as retention times are, can be inconsistent with this method due to the mobile phase gradient. Some of the other problems we've seen here are um, odd peak shapes compared to the calibration standards for some of the compounds. And I believe the purpose, the reason for that is, of course, that the compounds are not in pure form. 
compared to this calibration standards. Uh, there are other forms of these compounds. These are uh, conjugated forms of, of the individual that are fairly closely eluding, but not, not exactly the same uh, identity as the compounds we're calibrating with. So here's some in information about the um, about this relative abundance of these uh, of oleocanthal and the ratio at these different wavelengths seems to be very very consistent at all the concentration ranges. The ratio between the 220 and the 280 wavelength, which the 220 is much more sensitive. And here's a, um, a, uh, a chromatogram of California Cortina, which is a relatively high level of um, oleocanthal. Pungency comparisons, um, as uh, Mary pointed out, uh, pungency is a direct correlation between high, high, high polyphenol content and, uh, and the sensory attribute of, of pungency. See the chromatograms are significantly different between a, a qual and a um, multi cultivar low blend, low pungency blend. Our LCMS method is uh, relatively similar to the uh, uh, to the IOC method, the HPLC method in terms of sample prep. Uh, but uh, we have to dilute the sample significantly more because the NMS method is uh, is more sensitive than, than uh, H HPLC methods. Um, the uh, column that was used here is slightly different than the one uh, that's used in ISC method. Uh, the separation is a little bit uh, more um, more resolved uh, and is a little faster. The, um, the resolution is shown here. You see the peak shapes are very, very sharp and distinct. Um, the overlap of several of these peaks is not uh, critical uh, because uh, these um, particular uh, compounds are separated uh, uh, spectrally on the mass, on mass spec. So the, some overlap is not a problem. These calibration stands you see are from uh, 10 to 10 ppb to 1,000 ppb, and the correlation coefficient was very good. So uh, some precision data uh, on uh, the various um, compounds spiked into virgin olive oil uh, is uh, quite good, and, and of for reference uh, method ca uh, uh, capabilities, standard deviations quite good between uh, replicates. And we did a profile of um, uh, several uh, particular uh, California and, uh, and imported um, products of the various pungency factors. And um, we correlated that in this table with the uh, oleocanthal, oleorupine, oleacin, and oleviol, and the more common ones um, in terms of uh, the, the total part per million levels. Uh, of these individual uh, compounds versus their pungency and bitterness scores. And you can see they correlate fairly well. Um, and as expected, at the very bottom, we have a um, uh, account of the refined oils. Uh, of course, there's no uh, polyphenols remaining after refining. So much of the larger health benefits of, uh, of olive oil are actually negated in, uh, in the use of refined oil. And I think that's an important um, important uh, fact for the consumer. But the uh, correlation is very good. And as you see, the lower the, uh, the concern, concentrations of the various polyphenols, the, the lower the bitters and punishes scores that were obtained. So in, in, generally, in general, um, the pungency and, and uh, correlates best with uh, Oleo, oleocanthal, and I think that's a, a relatively similar fact that's been uh, noted in the literature. And bitterness correlates better with oleorupine. Um, 
shelf life and exposure is a factor in, in many of these major targets. So um, as we when we looked at some data uh, on uh, these major compounds, we noticed that over the shelf life of the product, these uh, these compounds do actually decompose. So buying and using oil when it's uh, freshly packaged is a uh, is an important consideration for the consumer. Um, refined oils, as we said, are essentially, essentially devoid of polyphenols. And uh, the LCMS method does produce some fairly reliable data for, um, for maybe uh, additional health claim benefits uh, for um, the polyphenol targets of interest. Um, more work is needed to explore the forms of polyphenols for which we do not, are not able to buy analytical standards for. And uh, this uh, method submitted by the University of Florence for uh, the EU label claims will be interesting in that way because they do not require reference materials for all, this, all the important forms. So future studies for us uh, would be to study um, these uh, hydrolysis preparation methods offered by the University of Florence to be able to support the EU health claims and to possibly support claims in the U.S. at a future date. Uh, compare uh, NMR testing with our LCMS results, and then continue to optimize the, um, the chromatography conditions and uh, concerns about reactivity during chromatography analysis. We'd also like to uh, extend our method to the use on olive pomace and, uh, and olive mill water. Uh, to determine the fate of polyphenols in those materials and the shelf life in those materials as they as the pomace uh, could be a very significant source of uh, polyphenol uh, raw materials for polyphenol extracts. I'd like to say thanks to um, Mr. Nick Wobbleck, who's uh, generated much of this data, and Kyle Ritchie in our lab, who also generated a lot of the HPLC data. Thank you very much. Okay, so that wraps up the presentation portion of today's webinar. Now we're going to move into a short question and answer session with our speakers. Um, feel free to continue to submit questions during the session. Remember that um, any questions that we don't get to, our speakers will follow up on an individual basis after the webinar. Okay, so I think this is a good first question to make sure everyone's on the same page. Um, I hear lots of reference to polyphenols in the industry. How does this relate to phenols? Um, yeah, I, I think uh, polyphenols and phenols are basically, um, I don't see any, uh, any difference in those uh, in those terms, in, in terms of the chemistry. Hello, yeah, and well. I think to, to tag on to that with you, John, um, I think typically in the olive oil industry, a lot of people have started to say polyphenol. Polyphenol is just a group of phenols that it has to do with the double bonds. So by saying phenols, we're actually more encompassing. So like tyrosol, where John was saying, where it's the one that he can test for, and it's an important one for health isn't a polyphenol, it's a phenol. And so we're trying to kind of adjust people's mindset of saying biophenols or phenols because that's more encompassing than polyphenols. It's more of a class. So it's just like a little technicality in how to say things. All right, thank you. Next question. Um, so what, if any, of these methods, I think the ones you were talking about, John, um, which which of any of these methods are you expecting a shift towards across the industry? I think across the industry, you're going to start seeing methods start to shift toward what is actually publishable, because that's where the real value in the method is is because of, is the commercial value of the product. Um, so you know, as these standards become a little bit more refined uh, by the agencies, uh, relatively governing agencies, I think that's going to drive the method development for the commercial product. The, the health researchers are going to need uh, some good data on on what a standard olive oil looks like, or 
for what a uh, a high value olive oil looks like. Uh, I think once that that data is generated, then I think that will be a, a, a good support to them. But I think the real the real important fact is the is whatever can be labeled, and, you know, for the consumer mm-hmm. use in terms of you know the actual um, the actual product he's buying. All right. Our next question is. All right. Um, is there any consistency in the rate of degradation among the various phenolics, or do they degrade at different rates? I'm sorry. Can you repeat? Oh, sorry. Um, okay. So the question is: Is there any consistency in the rate of degradation among the various phenolics, or do they degrade at different rates? I I would tend to believe they degrade at different rates depending on their mm-hmm. on the particular chemistry of that compound, but there's there's just limited data on shelf life right now of these individual of these individual compounds. Uh, to get a better grip on that, then I would suggest a more elaborate study being done on on a higher uh, on on actual several different levels of of, uh, of products. So we would take maybe a high bitterness oil, a high pungency oil, and then uh, study the, the shelf life on that one uh, versus maybe uh, a medium level bitterness and pungency and study the shelf life on that one. But that, that's certainly a good question and a good consideration for what we're trying to do because there are you know, significantly different health benefits between these various compounds. Yeah, and I think to add into that, um, Utilizing the me- the new methodology of testing specific phenols and any shelf life studies that are out there, most of them just do total phenol. So it only shows us that total phenol changes the time, but we don't know specifically. There's some research out there that shows which ones degrade faster or not, but there's not in olive oil really a shelf life study that's shown certain ones degrade over time, and that would be a good one to be able to look at so you can pinpoint which phenols that would be important to look at and you want high levels in your oil because they last longer or something like that. Yeah. And I, you know, I think that's also uh, an important consideration for, for a label claim too, is that, you know, the label claim has to support the level of, of phenol that's been stated on the label uh, for the entire shelf life that's there. So, you know, the, you know the the various uh, stability factors that we monitor are important, but the you know the actual claims factors are also very important. So it's just like any food, if the vitamin content um, is going is decreases over time, then it has to be considered when when labeling the product properly. All right, thank you. Um, now we'll go on to the next question. Um, Okay. Are you doing any studies that include squalene and its role as an anti-inflammatory with phenols? Um, I'm, we're not doing any any health claims, any health studies in that regard. But we we have developed a uh, a squalene uh, reference method using um, GCMS that is uh, that appears to be quite reliable uh, for um, for that test. And in addition to that, uh, we're working with uh, the QTA group to develop a near IR method uh, for the same purpose so that uh, the millers in California can follow squalene content in their products during production and during storage. All right. Thank you, John. Um, Our next question is, um, is the bitter and pungent score a five-point scale? As far as I know, it is. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm not a perfect sensory expert, but uh, it's whatever scale is the standard scale for IOC is what we follow yeah, in a, the bitterness, bitterness and pungency scores. I'm, I'm, I think it's five. It's a ten-point scale, actually zero to ten. Um, so fruitiness, bitterness, and pungency is part of the sensory analysis, and so for bitterness and pungency, it's a zero to ten on intensity level. Okay. Thanks, Mary. <laughs> Thank you both. Okay, the next question, and I think this is probably going to be our last question. So if anyone still has something that they want to ask Mary and John, uh, submit your question now and they'll follow up with you 
after this broadcast. Um, and here is the last question. Are many growers currently staged to influence the phenol content of their seeds? And a uh, follow up to that, how widespread is this knowledge in the industry? Um, I can take this one. I know in, in terms of in the industry, not widespread knowledge of knowing that we can influence phenol content, it's very known and, and it is driving from the industry to want this testing and to want to better understand our phenol contents in our oil. I know a lot of producers in California that are driving to learn on more education about this, um, as well as in other countries in Australia, in Italy, and in Spain. So I think that, to answer that second part, the first part, um, we wouldn't necessarily go to the quote unquote seed or tree level to manipulate that, but it kind of dictates what the producers, the millers, the growers kind of go off of what the millers want and the millers are the ones that know what they want to sell in terms of what the customer wants in terms of high or low or medium phenol content that drives and dictates what kind of varieties that are planted as well as what varieties produce most extraction efficiency and all of that. Um, so I think on the grower level, they are still learning and being educated on it as to how they can influence it. And that's just starting to become something new that we're, we're really in California at least trying to focus on and learn how we can or work on in the field level to affect the phenol content. All right, um, that was our last question. Um, that and that wraps up the Q&A session. Um, I want to remind everyone that a recording of this webinar, along with a copy of the slides, will be available to you in three business days. You'll receive an email and it'll have a link to download each of these. Um, thank you, Mary and John, for sharing your expertise and your presentations with us today. And thank you everyone for attending and having great questions.